we are live. That's how it works. But you're not truly live until you tweet about it, right? No. <laughs> or until or until the Twitch page refreshes and it starts playing the video. Oh my goodness. Well, hello and welcome, friends. Uh, I am Joshua Timberman, uh, head of community and advocacy here at Alma, and welcome to this week's live stream. This is where we talk to amazing tech leaders and practitioners. Today, our special guest is Sylvia Botros. Sylvia, would you please uh, give an introduction of yourself and let our viewers know where you work, what you do there, and how you developed an electromagnetic pulse? <laughs> um, I should let everybody know that when Joshua first sent me a link, it did not work, and we had to do it again. I'm not even sure what happened there, but we, we never really know, do we? Like, things always just break. It was wild. Computers were a mistake. Um, they were always a mistake. We should, we should get rid of them. Um, my name is Sylvia. Um, let's see. Right now, I am a software architect at Twilio. Um, I started off as a DBA with... Um, well, I started off with, with a CDN company that's long gone, and uh, I've been uh, in database land for a while now uh, with SendGrid and now with Twilio at large after they acquired SendGrid. Um, what do I do? I honestly couldn't tell you at this point. Um, help with database issues, accidentally QA things for people, I suppose. Um, yeah. Like Disney Plus. Stuff. Like Disney Plus this morning. Um <laughs> stream yard just now <laughs> the day is still young we'll find yeah. out yeah. um you know uh yeah that kind of thing so you know uh I, it, people on twitter sometimes think that it's uh, that is that we just say that as like a meme but it's actually very true and those who work with me have witnessed it many many times where i will just open a thing and it will not work uh and it's not just technology actually i've also done that to physical things in the past too so that's fun <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, yeah. So when I created this meeting invite, I called it databases, configuration management, and the nonsense we committed in their name. So I suppose that's primarily what we'll talk about. Um, but so you, you mentioned a long gone CDN company. Let's wind the clock back a bit. And uh, I'd like to know how you got started in tech. So I'm a first generation immigrant. I came to the States from Egypt in 2001. Um, so it took me a number of years to finish. I was almost 21 at the time and I was I had halfway through college back home. But um, when I came here, that obviously uh, lengthened the, the timeline. Uh, it took me until about 2007 for me to finish my computer science degree. Um, at that time, um, I got married. We, we moved to the East Coast for his work and my first job out of tech was at a company called Panther Express, uh, which did not last. Like that company went under in the 2008 crash. Uh, it was a CDN. It was part of a, uh, a group of companies that were started in what was, what was known at the time as Alley Corp. So some of the uh, sister companies in that uh, group of startups were more known names such as the Guilt Group, um, Tengen, which became MongoDB, um, Shop Wiki. Uh, it was it was a group of companies all started out from uh, basically the, the former co-founders of DoubleClick. Um, so uh, Panther Express was one of like the earlier in uh, uh, entrants in the CDN space at the time. CDNs were fairly new, I think, at the time. Um, mm -hmm. And um, after the crash, it was acquired by a competitor called CD Networks, and I lasted in that uh, in that gig for about four years. Um, it was though. I was hired initially as like a junior engineer straight out of college, and um, I got assigned to backend code that was mostly Python and Django. Um, it was a combination UI and the billing scripts that ran in the background. Uh, a few months in, uh, there was basically an all hands on deck. The script that did our uh, usage aggregation for billing purposes that ran every day was taking over a day to finish. Um, Long story short, this ended up being a database problem. The database had been set up and never touched. It was running default configs. My SQL defaults in 2008 were not exactly great. Um, this was 5.5. Uh, I'm absolutely aging. Oh, that's so modern. That's I was, so, like, I, I was using 5.3 in that, in that time frame. 
I know. I never used MySQL 3. I had only heard about it. So uh, at that time, I sort of like found myself knee deep into con into documentation. Uh, that was the time when I, I think, bought uh, my first technical book out of school, like outside of schoolwork, which was High Performance MySQL 2nd Edition, which was updated for 5.5. Um, it was it was a, a set of new authors at the time too. Um, and, you know, the rest was history. Like it's like in the um, everlasting rules of startups, if you're the last one who touched it, it's yours. Yep. So that's, that's how- That's not just limited to startups though. That's pretty much across- That's tech. true. <laughs> yeah, that happens everywhere. So, yeah. you know, at that point, the database is now, it's like, it's yours now. You own this. Uh, I ended up owning it all the way through those four years. It expanded into multiple clusters, um, especially through the acquisition. I ended up having to um, to basically be the person who gets to speak to this thing that CD Networks has bought that they didn't know very well. And um, the rest is history. After CD Networks, um, I wanted to move back to California. I, uh, through a recruiter, I heard about this company that makes money sending emails, which was news to me. Um, interviewed with them um, and, you know, ended up joining SendGrid. Uh, it was 10 years ago yesterday, actually, when I first started with SendGrid. And um, it's it's been that that was a whole other journey. Yeah. Yeah. That's super cool. Um, so. So let me get this straight. You you went to college, you got a degree, you got a job. And then the first thing you did was buy and read a book that you later wrote a better version. I mean, an updated version of. I know. It's, it's so cool. It's wild. <laughs> that is um, totally wild. So the way that happened is a few years into my time at SendGrid, um, I had I had spent the last, like, like the first few years at SendGrid were a blur. It's like, you know, when you have a kid and you don't remember the first six months, uh, multiply that by like four or five. So like the first two to three mm -hmm. years of Sengrid where a lot of incidents, just me running from one instance to the other, like, you know, hair on fire all the time, that kind of thing. Um, a few years in was when I, I, I wrote a blog post um, and uh, about how, how we do my sequel things at Sengrid. And um, I got a cold email from Baron Schwartz, who was the lead author of that second edition. At this point, he had left Percona and um, started his own company called Invivid Cortex. And um, it was a database monitoring um, product. Uh, he, he sends me a cold email and goes, I'm starting this new product uh, and I read your blog post. It looks very interesting to scale that Sengrid is trying to achieve with MySQL. Would you be interested into trying it out? Um, I was a slightly starstruck i was like man this this guy's emailing me okay and i was like sure let's try it out um it turned out to be a really useful email uh, i mean useful product i um at that point i was really feeling being a bottleneck for the company um when i joined sangrid engineering was maybe 30 ish people at that point we were probably close to 100 or more um and i was still the only in-house dba we had an amazing team of consultants as my um my on-call uh, but they were far less embedded with the rest of engineering than I was. Um, and so I was still very much a bottleneck and a single point of contact. So that product was very helpful in sort of helping teams help themselves, at least to a point. You know, here's how you look at these graphs. Here's how you figure out whether the problem is the database or not. If it's the database, is it IO? Is it network? Is it what? So uh, it was very, very useful. That ended up being a partnership that's still ongoing right now. We are still using that product after SolarWinds has bought it. Uh, but that also started a friendship with Baron. Uh, we sort of bonded on the fact that we, we, we both have twin children and um, we kept in touch um, uh, as friends for a while. And so when O'Reilly came to him asking, uh, during that period, he had already done, I think edition three at that point, it was already in the books. Um, and, you know, by the time O'Reilly was interested in a fourth edition, he had already sold uh, the company and, you know, he's now enjoying a much earned uh, semi-retirement. And so uh, it was actually his um, his idea to have me get involved. And, you know, I ended up dragging Jeremy, my co-author, into it. And it's the rest is history. Uh, the book came out middle of December. So it's fairly fresh. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, if you if you run MySQL 
at any large scale, or if you think it's going to be large scale, uh, hopefully it'll help. Excellent. Yeah, uh, I haven't I haven't run my SQL uh, in a minute. Um, <clears throat> it it actually I think the last time I I did anything meaningful with my with my SQL was uh, in the early days of the chef community, which is how we met. We met via the chef community. Um, what kind of automation things did you do with databases and chef? So when I joined SendGrid and um, I did not use any configuration management at the time myself at all. Um, uh, SendGrid at that point was using chef. chef SendGrid was very, was fairly early in chef. I think they, mm -hmm. uh, we started from like before the 1.0 version. Um, so at the time they had some chef in place, but not for databases. They did not feel, you know, that they had the expertise or safe to, to, to do it on the things that are that done the data. So for me, when I joined and I asked, how do we set up the databases? I was handed a Google doc with a bunch of commands to copy and paste. Um, I wasn't really shocked. I mean, that was basically standard operations we heard everywhere. Yeah. Um, they, they had, you know, in, in comparing server headcount, like they had, I think, maybe seven or eight database hosts compared to, at that point, already a few hundred of the other stuff. Um, so um, uh, fast forward, and I was, and I worked with that for a bit. Uh, it was fast forward another year in, I believe, when I started feeling like this was becoming, um, a hurdle like this was actually slowing me down um the the final part that sort of made me go no i have to learn this chef stuff and it, it needs to be used on the databases because this is not this is not scaling was a project where i had to sort of deploy hundreds of mysql instances um on uh on a bunch of servers um it was it was essentially we we had found ourselves in a situation where we needed to build the key value store using mysql on um on individual boxes with with multiple instances per box and it was like there's no way i'm gonna do this by hand and not screw it up every single time so that was the trigger for me to be like well if i'm doing chef might as well do it for everything for all the databases um i did cause a bunch of incidents during that journey not gonna lie uh, try managing my sql passwords with chef i'd rather not <laughs> while fighting with replication yikes and sort of <laughs> Too many times I'm like, oh man, I locked myself out of it again. Yep. Um, yeah. Uh, it's like, wait, what? Like, uh, you mean that that function that creates an random string ran every time? And so I changed the root <laughs> password every time? God damn it. Uh, yep. So that was that was a trip. Um, but eventually things stabilized and, you know, it was actually uh, ultimately a, a useful thing. I did refactor all of that uh, multiple times. Um, I had tripped on very common um, landmines. Like my initial idea was make one cookbook and just use attributes. That turned out to be a bad idea. Um, I'm so sorry. <laughs> a lot um, of that was my fault. <laughs> that attribute map, dude. Damn. Oh, gosh. Oh. So originally... Did I, did I sc Go ahead. Yeah, originally in, in Chef, I, the attributes were were implemented very simply. It was just a hash. But then I yeah. was like, hey, Adam, you know, maybe maybe I, I just want to like override this in a role. And he's like, yeah, that makes sense. We'll, we'll be able to do that. But what if I don't want to override it in a role? I want to override it in an environment. An environment. Oh, yeah, I guess that would make, that would make sense too. But what if I want to override them in my recipe? Oh, yeah, that, you know, that, that's a good place to override them as well. Like there's always these, you know, very nobody valid use cases. And nobody thought that we're going to end up with things like force override and force default. I, I think like, I remember I would be like, you know, there's no way to track back the number of hours lost of like, where is this attribute getting changed? Where yeah. are you changing? Oh yeah. Uh, and then like at some point going just like, fuck it, force override with a comment on top, like FML. <laughs> That's exactly. <laughs> just like, it's just like, no. Um, yeah, did, you ever, was... did you ever use the community MySQL cookbook or did you just write, rolled your own? Uh, I ended up rolling my own. I remember mm -hmm. looking at it at the time. It did not support the Percona server. Yeah, yeah. And I was very adamant. At, at the time, there was significant differences uh, mm -hmm. between the two that I wanted to use the Percona fork. And so that I ended up writing my own. But I, like, it was a very good reference still at the time, especially since I was learning how to do this myself. So it was a sure, good reference. Yeah. 
Um, yeah. D did you ever delve into into the the database cookbook? I did. I think I actually used that for a while. That one was useful. Like the 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 abstract, just you know, talk to it. It was, but it was a little meta, yeah. 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 So it was meta enough that it was useful for a good chunk of time. I don't think it's in use anymore. Um, I think at some point it's inter turned into a library. This is very long, long time ago now. Oh yeah. I remember oh, yeah. things from like eight, nine years ago. Um, yeah. I mean, that was but, that was a thing I remember only because of how much vitriol I got on the internet about those cookbooks. <laughs> It's so funny because I, looking back at it, I definitely at that at that time would initially would, would, would like sometimes have the emotional reaction like oh my god who did this and why, but then like I'm now like ten years into the same gig, some of my code is still running in production. Like some of the bash I wrote, like not Rubyism, some of the bash I wrote yeah. is still there. And now I'm like when I when I look at the team that I've left behind in the sacred ops group. Um, who will occasionally have to pull out one of my um, my horrible, horrible mistakes of the past. And I'm just like, sorry, like that happened. I, I can tell you why, but it's not going to make you feel any better about it. <laughs> it's just, you know, mistakes were made, man. <laughs> totally, totally. So so speaking of, of configuration management and databases, um, what other what other config management or infrastructure as code tools have you have you used for managing? databases have you moved on from chef or do you use something else or do you just stick with it because it works uh a lot of that infrastructure still runs with chef a i don't know how old the version is that they're on right now i've also not touched that code in a number of years but i believe chef is still there they're definitely looking at replacement now primarily because uh, a good chunk of that infrastructure the infrastructure outside of the databases is now in kubernetes so there's a strong motivation right now to come back into the same, because the way I look at these, like I did Chef at the time because that's what we were using mm -hmm. to run all the infra. But now yep. that they have eventually been are alone on the island, it's time to come join the flock because yes. that will always be better. <laughs> yeah, totally. So, so yeah, they're looking at, the, at doing that. Although, you know, they're still figuring out that gap between uh, Kubernetes is, you know, um, official paradigm of stateless and um, immutable infra versus something like databases just coming in and going, nah, but you can't just like, you know, poof the database and expect it to come back in a few seconds or milliseconds. Well, yeah. So, so should people run databases in Kubernetes? I, I think that landscape is going to, like the answer to that question is going to change within the next few years. But there's still enough sharp edges to it now that you still got to be careful. Now, there's there's definitely a lot of movement in that space now. Folks like Planet Scale are doing really good work into figuring out those sharp edges. I also know a couple of you know large companies with amazing database engineering teams who are starting to get into this um, and have started to learn some sharp edges. But if you are if you are not a Shopify or a you know a large a large internet provider like you know Shopify, AWS, or like cloud provider, digital like if you're not one of those guys, I would question the reasoning of wanting to do it if you could mm -hmm. have spent your time on other things. So yeah. it's still it's still a very volatile kind of space, um, and there's so many good options out there as far as managed databases that like why would you? So um, yeah, so it's a difficult that, question to answer right now. It is, it is. And the last time I really did anything with Kubernetes was actually a couple of years ago. Um, and all, and the best practice at the time, if you're running your Kubernetes cluster, and this is like before EKS, like was really good. Um, if you're running your AWS or you're running your Kubernetes cluster on AWS, then just use AWS RDS for your databases and then tell your application config to point to those. And that is what is what we did and it worked perfectly we had like a couple small mysql and a postgresql for some of the applications that we were that we were putting into kubernetes um but like what what did what do dbas do in the age of databases as a service and i realized that that turns into an acronym of dba as so is it dba <laughs> as a service um all, like almost so 
I think there's still a lot for folks who, who come from DBA world to, to, to be helpful with. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you, even if you're running managed databases, it still doesn't do everything, everything for you. Like um, it'll- I it'll, thought the cloud was solving all those problems. I know, right? And it's scaled <laughs> infinitely too. Yes. Um, think like even like, like as far as I'm concerned, one of the, the best managed MySQL compatible options out there is Aurora. And while it's great, it still doesn't do things for you like, um, you know, confirming your restores work. Um, it will allow you to do terrible things with credentials and security if you don't know what you're doing. Um, it will, I mean, it, it internalizes really complex parts like write failover and scaling reads, which is a lot, um, but it's still not 100%. And if you are a company, you know, more and more companies now, even at earlier stages, have to grapple with things like data governance and data residency. Um, th those are things that you need someone who understands how data behaves and how it can be like an anchor to your velocity as an engineering org. Um, that, you know, something like Aurora is not going to just solve for you out of the box. It's very contextualized to your data. So um, I think this is a good thing where database engineers are more focused into on, you know, how do you how do you cross security checks of some sort if you're at that stage of a company and, and how to do things like data residency and how to um, uh, think about, you know, which data goes where and so it does the most value, um, how to shard your data in a way that makes sense for your product. Uh, that's, these are a lot of things that you're not going to get out of managed databases. Um, uh, everybody. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So, so let's wind up, let's wind the conversation back a little bit. I mean, with, with the, uh, the advent of databases as a service, um, and a lot of people in tech being generally younger, just as a, as an age trend, what do DBAs do? Most people probably don't know what DBAs are, are administering. Is it like a sysadmin that has root in the database or, I mean, maybe it's a, maybe it's a DevOps or an SRE now, but, uh. What what is what yeah. is the, the general the general um, like the engineering work that, that you're seeing now, especially working with databases as a service? I believe the new uh, hip thing is to call them DBREs, and um, I mean that probably came out of uh, Lane Campbell's and Charity Major's book, which is an excellent book, by the way. Mm -hmm. But you know that's this is what tech does: you turn a book into a job title. Um, <laughs> that's why we have SREs instead of sysadmins. Exactly. Thanks, Google. Yeah, um, but as far as what DBE teams do, um, I look at them as um, if you are a company that knows your engineering org is gonna double, triple every year through just sheer hiring, uh, you need DBEs to be the subject matter experts who help, you know, are involved from like planning phase so that you're not making decisions that later on in production, you're like, yeah, so we had this incident and the database did this thing and nobody on the team that's on call for this thing actually understands how it happens. Um, uh, this, like, um, like the, the feedback loop of incidents is very, it's, it's long and it's very expensive for businesses. So it's companies who, who, presume that managed services will make it where you don't have to worry about your engineers understanding um, the trade-offs of, of everything they use and grab off of the cloud shelf. Like mm -hmm. this is how you end up tripping on that. Uh, hiring DBEs, and it doesn't have to be a lot from day one. Like I'm like, given how the market is, like DBEs are very expensive to hire, but it's something to have in mind as like, I need some shape of that skill set to exist in my end work. It can start initially as consultants or, um, or even leaning on your own cloud providers, um, account management team to help you, to help give you the context. At some point, though, it's going to have to be in-house expertise that you rely on, not just in incidents, but in even in planning. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, and even, even when you're using the managed database services, um, we, we were on RDS uh, PostgreSQL and had to do an upgrade. We, we were being forced off of, I don't know, it was like version 10 to version 11 or 9 to something, whatever. Um, we, we, were, we had to migrate to a new version, which means yep. uh, migrating to a whole new cluster. Like they don't just, it isn't just uh, an RPM install. 
<laughs> when, when you're using an RDS, right? You have to you have to snapshot the data, bring up the new instance, point your DNS records to it, and you know restore that snapshot in there. And it, it's uh, this dog and pony show. And uh, oh yeah, you also have to know things about your data that are relevant for you know the upgrade process. Like uh, what was it we had to do? We had to do like an analyze plan or something like some Postgres mm -hmm. internal command thing that we're you're supposed to do after, and didn't do that, and it caused the the uh, the layer that of of the API that did all the authentication or authorization requests. All of those were taking forever, and by forever I mean like two seconds. But every single API interaction hit that, so that database was just uh, just Crawling. brought everything to a standstill, and we didn't. We're like. Uh, no idea. What and it's not on. just relational. Like I've seen this even in like things like that are even more mature, like Dynamo, because you'll have like if you don't have expertise in ha like if you're going to be like using Dynamo heavily, if you don't have expertise in the house uh, from planning phase to help your larger engineering group who are like you said younger and not used to and you know are far more comfortable just grabbing a thing they don't fully understand the internals of, uh, you can run into risks of teams sort of like you defining the wrong sort key, using secondary dynamo indexes in a way that they were not meant to, to be used, um, not using, you know, not partitioning the data properly and causing hotspotting. Uh, I know that has been mitigated heavily by, by AWS, but you know, you could still like leave, leave young engineers with a tool and they will find a way to break it. <laughs> like, do you, like, so do you want to find those potential issues at planning phase or while they're in, is it in production and you don't have expertise in house to help? Yep. Totally. Yeah. Um, so that, that bring, brings up another question. Uh, what's your favorite uh, distributed no SQL data store? Is it Dynamo or is it one of the other ones? I, I favorite feels very terminal to me i have seen so many like especially in the last few years after expanding my uh experience in like larger twilio um i have seen so many different examples of like either the constraints of the product or the constraints of the team or the culture of the org where like in some cases i'm like yeah use use this thing that i wouldn't use any other place just because this is probably the best fit for your kind of state now mm -hmm. if i was just if you were just hypothetically, I'm building a thing and I know it's not going to need relational data and I need to use a data store for it. Um, I would probably still use Aurora only because a thing that is new is a probably is not a good fit for something like Dynamo. Dynamo, like data modeling in Dynamo, requires you to know um, a lot about your query patterns, and that does not a good fit for basically Greenfield. If it's if it's browner field, like it's like a re-architecture of a thing. And so we already understand access patterns. We just need to rewrite it for whatever reason. That might be closer to using Dynamo because if you can figure out a good uh, data model for Dynamo, it can do some really amazing things and scale very, very well. But if you are sort of like the green field and you still don't actually have a lot of faith into the access patterns you have at hand, you think you're going to change a lot. Uh, relationals remain remains still one of the most flexible in that arena, but the trade off is like it's relational, so that you know that always comes with trade offs. Yeah, having to use SQL and then using an ORM to you know. <laughs> yeah, figuring out if you need to use an or yeah, if you need to, you need to use an ORM or if you're going to write the SQL yourself and just use something simpler like their proxy, um, you know, maintenance windows. Uh, which version of Aurora we need. like? So there's obviously like a whole long tail of, of things to respond to at that point. But you start from the understanding that we're doing this because we don't yet know our access patterns. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what is the, what is the weirdest or worst production use case you've seen somebody do with MySQL? I've seen a lot of. I don't know if I would call any of them weirdest, but I've definitely, I've seen my SQL used for like, why, why would you do this so many times? Like I've done it myself. Like I'll, I'll pick on myself for that one. Like this, this project I was mentioning earlier that sort of forced me to go learn chef and to play a bunch of databases. Mm -hmm. um, 
this was a URL shortener that Sangrid needed um, to harken back to, um, you know, constraints of the time leading to certain decisions that you from the outside would go like, why in the world would you do this? <laughs> um, we didn't have any expertise in key value data stores. Sangrid was running in its own servers. We were not in the cloud at all at the time. Mm -hmm. So like Dynamo was not, an, was not really an option. Um, we didn't have any Cassandra expertise, but the shape of the problem is key value stored. And I was the only one in, and it was like, like the most familiar thing we can do this with is my SQL. So we have to figure out how to create a key value store that shards, that scales horizontally can sustain at least like, I think at the time it was like 30% of our volume. Like it was, it was a feature needed by our highest volume customers at the time. And so it was not like a new product just because we want to. So we had, um, it was not an option for Elasticsearch. <laughs> also B, get out. <laughs> B, B is just being B. Um, yes, of course. <laughs> we did have Elasticsearch at the time. And the other guy who was the Elastic, who is still, he's still with us in Sangrid. Uh, he was like, don't talk, like, no, you, you don't get to come near anywhere near that search for this problem. And I support that because it was not a good fit. Um, so, you know, constraints at the time, it was like, we got to go in MySQL. And I ended up doing this very weird and fangled design with like writers in every data center with replicas in the other data centers and having to manage all of that config in some tables. And it was, it was a mess. Um, not a good MySQL, like I, we learned a lot. This thing, yeah, I bet. For, this thing lived for five plus years. We only killed it a couple of, uh, we only killed it in 2020. Um, wow. Yeah. Wait, did, did, did you kill it or did COVID take it out? No, we killed it. <laughs> <laughs> that one, um, thankfully the team finally, like at that point we, we were able to, 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 you know, carve out the roadmap area to sort of rewrite it in, in, in what made sense at that point. Like we, we wrote it in Dynamo at the edge and it, it's much, much better now. But, you know, five years in, we learned a lot about do not use MySQL that way. Um, I learned a lot about trying to run my multiple MySQL instances on one box. Uh, I do not recommend it. No. Absolutely no, I, not. I remember, I remember speaking of Chef, I remember uh, Sean O'Meara was refactoring the entire MySQL cookbook to make a MySQL resource. And he was testing it and ran multiple instances of MySQL on, I think he was doing it in Docker containers on his laptop, disconnected from the internet on a plane. And um, it, it, it was just... All, all in all, a terrible idea because his computer was completely unusable because the the every, everything I, trying to put sockets and all that like three or five instances of MySQL in a in a tiny VM. My first iteration of this was ten instances. I did write the cookbook from scratch myself for that one. I remember testing it the, for the first time on my laptop, and then the laptop literally just like hot, 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 hot on my lap. And I just had to like set it aside and just like hardware reset it. Cause it was just like, nope, not doing that. I didn't even do it with containers because containers were fairly new at the time. Like this was before Docker, I think even existed. Uh, like containers were still the old school LXC only. Mm -hmm. um, so I did it with instances on the servers directly using different ports and using VIPs in the front to talk to them. So you'd hand You'd hand every, um, I use attributes heavily for this. <laughs> that cookbook was a shit show. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I, I like, I feel like I should grab a copy of it, you know, just for posterity before they nuke it out of on GitHub or something. Cause I'm like, <laughs> there were some really like weird things done in there. And I would look at it and I'm like, what was I thinking? Why did I think this was a good idea? But it's just like, you're halfway into the tunnel. And it's too late to back out. Yep. So all you gotta do is just keep digging to come out the other end. That was basically oh, yeah. that. Well, I mean that that's that's how attributes got to be such a mess. It's like I yeah. I found a shovel like, and I started digging. She's like, well, then, too late now. <laughs> I'm already in the dirt. I mean, this somebody's <laughs> running this in production. I can't change it now. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Past Sylvia made a lot of mistakes in that one. Yeah, totally. I hear you there. Um, yeah, get blame. Oh, who who wrote this nonsense? Oh, get blame. It was me. 
Yeah. Every time. I, I think I still to this day, like occasionally will pop into our my old team's um, chat and I'll be like, yeah, that still exists. Uh, it's worse with the patch that I've written though, because you know, when it's like five years later and the thing that's sort of informing whether we passed certain controls and how fast these backups, you know, take to restore and then they're going and it's like, it's bash. And it's gosh, it's Sylvia wrote like six years ago. And I'm just like, yeah, you know. Yeah, but but it still runs. It's still running. I couldn't possibly tell you how it works at this point because I was like heavily pregnant at the time and we need to get it done before I was out with twins. So Totally, yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a, I have another question uh, about uh, distributed NoSQL databases. Are data lakes a real thing? They are. What you what, know. what is a data lake? Like I, I've I've only seen memes about them. I haven't seen like, I know. actual real things. We're really good at tech at just making words <laughs> lose all meaning whatsoever, even when they did actually make sense in a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, I mean. It, I don't like any business at this point, like just every interaction with their customers, every everything that happens, that can be a piece of data that, that they will find a way to want to use later. So um, places where it's been like, um, like data lakes, as far as I'm, as, as my understanding of them is, is large, far larger than like the individual data stores that you got to run to make a thing happen in the con in the context of just the service that you, that you're running. Um, now, unwinding that large pile of toothpaste back into tubes that make sense for the business, that's, that's the hard part with things like data lakes, which is why like now like the really fun one that's starting to emerge is like reverse ETL, where it's just like, um, yeah, like when uh, one of my coworkers, um, Ryan Horn, when he explained that one to me, I was just like, man, I'm too old for this. <laughs> like that was the only reaction I could give out. I was just like, I'm just too old for this shit. Um, and it's it's essentially you take data that was already ETL into your data lake and trying to sort of figure out from it um, where it came from and what how it came to be and it's um, it, there's a lot of potential there but I mean do data lakes exist yes um, do does everybody who mentions them know what they are and it's actually talking about the right thing absolutely not absolutely not yeah. it's exactly like DevOps like I still remember arguments over arguments on Twitter about what the hell is DevOps and I'm just like yep. no. Move on. It's been yeah. ruined. It's too late. <laughs> it has. It truly has. Um, yeah. The, uh, the the all the DevOps arguments. Um, I remember it was either Gene Kim or John Willis said, uh, "I just know it when I see it. I know when somebody's. I know when an organization is doing DevOps. Um, they don't have DevOps. They're doing DevOps, and that was like the the a thing that people tried to hold on to, but you know." then it turned into a job title and I, yeah, I mean, I feel it's just capitalism is going to capitalism and <laughs> yeah. much respect to recruiters who actually try to, you know, get the right people for the right job. But there's mm -hmm. a large cohort in that field who are just trying to fill spots and, you know, this is going to keep happening. Mm -hmm. like, well, yeah, now it's SRE. Now it's SRE or DevSecOps, uh, FinOps, I have, I've seen some combinations of those where I was just like, please, God, don't. Nobody do we, knows do we have blockchain about. ops yet? Oh. Right? It's, I, I, I felt dirty saying that. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you should feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do. I think that's the only time I've said, the, said those words together uh, out loud um, in weeks. Yeah. I'm trying to recover. Yeah. Um, cool. So let's see. Uh, other questions I have for you. I think we've gone through most of them. Um, has Botrost ever been a trending tag hashtag on Twitter? It hasn't. Thank God, no. Because like I, I, I'm starting to worry. Like at some point, I'm gonna have like dudes in suits and dark sunglasses just like yanking away <laughs> for right? in a lab somewhere. Yikes. It's 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 terrifying. And here's the thing. Like I. I admit, in some cases, I am the one who sort of tempts fate. Like, for example, and I know this is going to shock you, I drive a Tesla. <laughs> right? I, 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 I knew that because you, you posted about a, an update to it the other, the other week or something. Yeah. And I was just, I was floored. 
Why? Why would you do that? <laughs> I mean, the reasons like if you take out the EMP part, like we had solar mm-hmm. for a while, we we're like, it doesn't make sense to be paying gas for two cars. This is Southern California where gas is expensive and occasionally mm-hmm. we drive long distance. So it's just like we need it. We should switch one of them to solar. It'll save a bunch of money, use a lot of this energy. Um, we're a family of five. We have like we'll, we will probably use it as the local road trip car because it's because of the energy savings. So it's like all that made sense. The only car in the market right now that's has been around for a bit that fits all these things was you know a large Tesla, and it was just like yeah, okay, fine, we'll get it. Um, the number of issues I have found in that car, Joshua. Like I hate the doors. The UI breaks all the time. <laughs> Learned within six months how to reboot the entire entertainment center because I had to. Um, it's it's so bad. It's so so bad. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, and I will complain about it. And uh, my friend Sean Kilgore, who I think you've interacted with on Twitter, yeah. he's, like, he's like, "Well, you bought this. Like, why would you do it?" I'm like, "Dude, I had my reasons." <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I, just like attributes or or storing a url shortener's data in mysql it seemed like a good idea at the time yeah or me deciding like i i me and sean gilgore were desk buddies for like a year although we've been working together for like a long long time now mm-hmm. uh, but the, his when he first started at sengrid we actually sat next to each other and i we have lost count of the number of times within that one year he watched me completely nuke my ruby environment because I got it in a state where it's just like the dependencies will not. I mean, like, I mean, it's Ruby. That, so that's, that's, so that's the hanging cards. fruit. Yeah. Like right, I love like, Ruby. I love Ruby so much. It's my favorite programming language, but yeah, like that, that that's not just you. <laughs> but here's the thing. Like at the time I was still naive. Like at the time we, we weren't really noticing that I was breaking things all the time. So mm. it was sort of like, in the back of our head but we didn't realize it and i kept thinking at the time that it's not me that it's like i should switch to rbn or i should switch to the other one which i whose name i forgot right now and it's just like eventually after switching back and forth and breaking both mm-hmm. and in some cases having cases having both running at the same time and neither of them working exactly how i wanted to <laughs> and sean was just like i don't think it's either of them i think it's you it's like, i, th- you should, I you think should the best thing we I think the best thing we ever did at Chef was create Chef DK and make that package just that include was... all of the stuff that you need and ship that. When that finally came out, man, I was it was like Christmas. Yeah. Was, at that, at that was... point, I think I was like three, four years in and I had to done some things to my laptop. <laughs> like my laptop would be like, no, like you can't run all of these things at the same time. Like this dependency does not make any sense. And it's just like, no. I still have, uh, so I, I bought one of my chef laptops from the company years and years ago and I still have it. It doesn't boot anymore. Um, but the last time I used it, it was still like, I hadn't touched the Ruby environment on it for so long. Cause I, I bought it for personal use and I, didn't i wasn't doing ruby development in my in my free time it still had like the chef dk version two i think oh. whatever whatever came out in like 2016 vintage oh yeah nice oh, yeah. vintage yeah it was like a, a ruby one nine i think it wasn't even ruby two yeah it was, it was I some, spent some era of that yeah yeah, like that was that was the time when I had to figure out how to write all those chef cookbooks. Like it was all the one nine era, and it was it was rough times. Um, last time I had to look at something and it turned out to be Ruby was like earlier this week. Uh, my personal blog, I had not touched it since I announced I was going to be working on a book, so it's like it was just like languishing for a while. And I was like, I should just at least update the bio section in it so that when people look at it, like I have done things in the last two years. Um, uh, that was your first mistake. Well. <laughs> I run my blog on GitHub Pages, yes, which is Jekyll under the hood. So yes. I'm sitting on my couch with my laptop and I'm going, I should figure out how to test this stuff locally before I, you know, push to master, push to main, my mistake. Um, and I open, I Google how to test Jekyll and I noticed that it's like it's root and I, I had forgotten that completely. Like that's how long it's been. And mm-hmm. I realized that Jekyll is like, it's all Ruby based and it's like, you got to do this thing with RBM. And I'm just like, nope, 
<laughs> testing, I'm testing in production. <laughs> this is what being an architect is like, by the way. Yeah, um, testing prod. Just like, no, nah, screw it. Push to main. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I, I went through that uh, with right after the the chef acquisition and uh, when I when I made my career uh, change to a different company for the first time in like 13 years, I updated my blog and it was, you know, it, it, it was Jekyll by way of Octopress because Octopress was the, was a cool theme that did all the, all the hip Jekyll stuff, but you didn't have to think about the Jekyll parts of it. Um, and I started trying to update things and I forgot that it uses a special, a special branch when you push to main or you merge a pull request uh, on the repository on GitHub, then the GitHub backend for pages builds a branch and it puts yeah. it there. And I, and when you do local development, it does special things in there. And I was like, I don't remember any of this stuff. I hadn't yep. touched the touch that in years. So I was like, all right, uh, grab all the .md files out of the, out of the post directory and put them in a new repository basically. <laughs> Oh, there you go. Yeah. Blow it, it all up. Uh, yeah, blow it all up. Uh switched the theme. I went to, you know, uh, plain Jekyll with the solar I think the solarized theme, because that's what I use for my editor. So yeah, it, it simplified everything. I did GitHub Actions, which was super cool. Uh hadn't used those yet. So yeah. I a whole lot of not having I don't want to have to think about fighting with my blog software in order to write a thing and then publish it. I want to write it in Markdown and then have it show up in Solarized. Yeah. Like this blog before I moved to, before GitHub pages became a thing and I moved to do it was like a, a, a droplet a DO. Oh yeah. That came, that came baked in with Ghost. And I I ended up deciding that even that was too much cognitive load for me. Just like I'm yeah, like totally. no, I'm not even I'm not even managing versions on Ghost in a DO. Like just here GitHub, just do it. Um, yeah, make it go. Yeah, I, I yeah. originally started writing my blog. I think I was using Posterous. I don't even know if that is around anymore. I don't think so. But yeah, I, th I remember I think, it. I think they vanished. That may be why I moved. I was going to use Tumblr or I did use Tumblr for a second because all the all the hip cool kids were on Tumblr and then uh, Tumblr got passed around between like five different companies. And so like all right. the back end stuff didn't work the same way or something. Um, and then I was like, all right, well, Let's let's try this on GitHub Pages. That seems like something cool, and it worked. Right. Yeah. At this point, I don't even try to change the theme. Like it looks exactly the same as it did for a few years now. I'm just yeah. like, no, it's good. It works. Yeah. Well, and then and nowadays at Alma, we have uh, our blog is in Graph CMS because that's what our whole site is in. And Graph CMS is an interesting thing that I had not used until I came to Alma. So it's like a graph database with a CMS it, on top. It, of it? it uses, I think, I, I don't like. There's a, it's a Rube Goldberg machine of of startups. I think. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, not right. So there's there's a GraphQL. Uh, you you write um, you write like your uh, your schema for your site. And you tell it like what your different kinds of pages are and what the different components of a page is going to have. And then uh, you do the CSS for each of those components. And then that is a repository that you can push to uh, GitHub or GitLab or whatever. And then that gets deployed. And then you go into Graph CMS and then you actually create the content in there and it stores that in the database. And that stuff is not in the repository. I think <laughs> it's like a lot of work. I mean, it's not, it, but I, you know, it's not just for the blog, it's for the whole company size. So like, yeah, the, the, the whole context. site. Yeah. So, so like it made sense to put the blog in there and uh, we, we have, we have amazing engineers that got that up and running really quickly. And all I have to do, actually, all I have to do to write a blog post is write a Google doc. And then our, our editor in chief, she'll uh, put it into the graph CMS and, and make it go live on the blog. It's amazing. That's nice. Yeah, when it's yeah. when someone else has to do the thing, you care a lot yeah. less and, about how it's built. And and she's 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 really good at it. Like she's you know she's an editor in chief. Like she's really good at you know cleaning up content and putting it into the right place. I mean, I wouldn't be shocked if 
major newspapers run with something similar under the hood. Right. Yeah. Oh, they're all, they're all probably just running on WordPress. <laughs> oh God, I hope not. Cause that's a whole security <laughs> crap shoot. <laughs> yeah. WordPress. I don't miss it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh. oh my goodness. Um, well, cool. We're, we're getting close to the, the top of the hour. This has been absolutely super fun. And I have one more question. This is very important. What is your favorite candy bar and why is it Twix? It is Twix. I mean, in the, I mean, to be honest, I don't eat, a, I, eat I, don't, I rarely eat candy, but you know, I would probably go for a Twix if, if, it, if you have given the opportunity, like far less than sick of a Butterfinger. Mm, yeah, that's way too much work. Yeah, like it gets stuck in your teeth and then you're yeah, like... Yeah, like I don't need to be doing all that crunching. Like who who mm -hmm. has time for that? Life's too short. Yeah, I mean, the, the only redeeming quality that Butterfinger has over Twix is that uh, Twix has gluten in it. My wife can't eat those. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I, uh, I, have, I have a couple of friends who are who are not very tolerant to gluten and I'm just like, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm also not a huge fan of peanut butter, which I know will get me a lot of a lot of fire. But uh, I don't of butter? like peanut butter. Oh, peanut butter, peanut butter. Yeah, like I don't I don't really seek out peanut butter, which is also why I'm not crazy about Reese's. It's just like, eh, sure. Yeah, but Reese's has had these uh, peanut brittle Reese's cups that we got at, at the holidays, and they're pretty they're pretty delicious actually. <laughs> So here's the weird thing about me. Like I like peanuts and then mm. I like peanut brittle. I'm cool with cause it's like caramel with the peanuts in there. Pulverize the peanuts and I'm completely uninterested in them. I don't know. I know it doesn't make any sense, but you know. Yeah. I, I, I don't mind peanut butter. Like I don't, I don't eat a lot of it, but I like, like it in some things like Reese's cups. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't particularly like peanuts. <laughs> See, but you know, compliments. You know, I'll take yeah. the peanuts. You take the peanut butter. There we yeah, go. exactly. Yeah, like uh, if we go to a burger place, um, my my wife says, "Oh, you know, I'll I'll take the pickles uh, off his sandwich." I'm like, "No, they just, those, those pickles just never should never be on my sandwich in the first place." You complete each other, though. There you go. They'll just they'll just put them on her plate directly, and yeah. Then, yeah. <laughs> well, excellent. Um, so to wrap up, let's uh. Let's chat about something that isn't related to tech, you know, that isn't uh, Tesla's, um, which is <laughs> strangely tech, right? Um, I know. So what what was it you were watching on Disney earlier or trying to? I was to... trying to catch the Eternals because I have not been in a movie theater since probably Endgame is the one I remember last. Um, and so I was trying to catch Eternals and halfway into it, you know, the whole thing just fall, fell apart. I'm still not done with it because it's a very long movie and I ended up having to step away for a few times, which is really the nice thing about streaming. But yeah, um, I'm sorry to my friends over at Disney, like trying to watch <laughs> the movie. And sure enough, like I, op I opened Down Detector and there was like a, an increasing number of reports about streaming breaking there. And I was like, God damn it. Like, <laughs> this, is, this is all your fault. <laughs> this is getting dangerous. <laughs> So you, so you have to apologize to your friends at Disney for the unprecedented number of 500s that they're seeing in their alerting yeah. Slack. And that's the thing, like at this point, like we've, like I've been to enough conferences, had enough conversation with like, I, I know folks at almost all of those companies. I'm just like, I'm sorry. I was yep. trying to use the thing and I thought it would be fine because we never know when the EMP is going to hit. Right? <laughs> yeah, it, we really don't. Excellent. I haven't seen Eternals. Um, and I don't remember, I think the last superhero movie we watched, was, we watched Wonder Woman 84. I'm sorry. Yeah, that was... That was a was very fun. strange experience. Yeah, it, it, it was both, fun. both fun and terrible. And just, like, you come out and I'm like, I don't understand what just happened. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> the first Wonder Woman was so amazing. What, what happened here? I really don't know. I remember watching it and I was just like, okay. Well, I mean, there were fun moments, but what? Yeah. Yeah, the... Yeah the the whole the whole thing with the with the wishes and it's like when did it turn into an Aladdin movie what what is happening <laughs> <laughs> at least there that? wasn't a, a a singing what toucan no not toucan uh parrot right that parrot yeah gosh it's been a while since I've seen Aladdin <laughs> Me too. it's probably on Disney Plus 
Probably. I know. Like if I started digging into like all the nostalgia in there, I'm probably going to never get anything done for like a few weeks. Yeah. I <laughs> yeah. know that feel. Pretty much. We, we watched, we watched the matrix recently and then we watched the matrix. The, uh, the new one. We, yeah. We, that we one. watched. Yeah. We, we watched the new, we were going to watch the new one with a kid. Um, but he, and he's 15. So he hasn't seen the, uh, the, the originals, ones. but we didn't have time to watch all all three and then the fourth one so we just watched the first one and you don't really need to see two and three to go from one to four no not that much also like three will put you to sleep three is yes <laughs> yes <laughs> three was i, I, I don't remember recently and i was just like man this is just a slog <laughs> yeah i i i don't remember three because i think i've only seen it a couple times and I think I've probably fallen asleep most of the time I watched it. Right? Yeah, like like two, you can maybe power through. It sort of has some momentum from the first one. Third one, just like no, nah, no. Nah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Well, excellent. Well, thank you, uh, thank you for joining us today. This will wrap up our stream. Thank you out there for watching uh, and chatting with us. Um, and if you would like to join our stream at some point in the future and have some fun and crack jokes and be silly uh you can email community at alma.io or tweet at us and uh yeah i look forward to seeing you on the internet thank you joshua yep bye